All right. Welcome, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. Apologies for the brief delay there. We had, you know, it's 2021. There had to be some sort of technical issues, but I'm just super excited to be joined by our guest today, Lance Mortlock. Lance, how's it going today? It's pretty good. Yeah. I'm glad we finally made it work. Oh, man. You know, like we have to plan for unexpected things, which is exactly, you know, why we're here. So I'll give people your your title. So Lance is the senior strategy partner and Canadian oil and gas industry leader at Ernst & Young. And he is also the author of Disaster Proof Scenario Planning for a Post-Pandemic Future. Lance has got an extensive background, both education and work-wise in various different organizations. But Lance, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about you, fill in the blanks there, and if there's anything uh, else that's uh, relevant to share. Yeah, sure. And and I, I guess thanks. Uh, thanks, Anthony, for uh, for having me on your show. Three things I would say in terms of my background and what I kind of bring bring to the table, as it were. Um, you know, one being an author, uh, I've spent the last 20 years writing a lot of different points of view around different management topics and in industry challenges, particularly in the energy industry. Uh, love love business, uh, love what what different leaders are trying to do and, and, and like to write a lot. And then my second role is as a visiting professor at one of the universities up here in Canada. Uh, I spend a lot of time working with students on advanced strategy and and teaching, and I really enjoy that. And the third role, uh, and probably you know, ninety five percent of my time is is really as a strategy partner, helping clients at EY with very complex problems, and that really gives me a lot of exposure to all kinds of situations, uh, which is fascinating. Hmm. That's awesome. So on our, our audience today, we have senior managers, middle managers. I see, I know some folks in education, some folks in, um, well, the multiple different business lines, uh, healthcare, et cetera. I imagine that in your current role and in some of your past roles, you've seen various different industries, various different challenges. Um, tell me a little bit about what are some of the common problems you solve on, on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, so good, good question. Um, I, so I, I get pulled into uh, all kinds of organizations. In fact, not just oil and gas, but a lot of energy companies, power and utility, mining, government, pub, public sector, infrastructure. And a lot of like, a, a lot of what I'm getting pulled into, I would say right now, Anthony, is, um, you know, cost reduction. You know, we're trying to figure out how do we fundamentally change uh, our cost profile of our organization? Can you and your team and EY come in and help help fix that? I get pulled into discussions around and projects around, we're thinking about the future and we need someone to perform a study of the market and help us figure out you know, what's going on in the market in terms of competitors and different players and um, customers. Uh, and then we want to use that as a basis to create a strategy. Can you come in and help facilitate and guide us through uh, through that process? So usually I would say, Anthony, when, when there is a high degree of change involved in an organization, that's when, you know, leaders would tend to pick up the phone and, and call me and, and engage my team and myself in helping with that process. Mm, I got that. So I do see, I mean, maybe I'll go into, you mentioned a lot of resource industries and you mentioned a lot of change. You know, why is it important to think of the future when you're building your strategy and how does scenario planning as a tool, and I see it as a tool, but I'd love to get your perspective. How does scenario planning as a tool fit into managing that change and planning for the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's important to think about the future. And this dawned on me, in fact, when I was, um, you know, writing the book. And and it's it's been a couple of years, uh, uh, quite a long process to kind of get through and and write disaster proof. But it dawned on me, and particularly in the energy sector, where I've spent you know quite a big proportion of my my career over the last twenty years just how uncertain and volatile it is. I mean, I, you know, the common term that we use is VUCA, volatility, 
uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And you think about the oil and gas sector globally and, and in Canada, where I live, um, you know, booms and busts. And when you're a management team, it's very, very hard to kind of weather that storm, to kind of handle those those periods of booms and those periods of busts and, and keep them, the organization moving in the right direction. So, you know, for me, that was a big part, part of the why, Anthony, to your question. Um, and I think, you know, in my, in my experience, I, very early on in my career, I spent quite a lot of time at Shell. I worked with Shell on their scenario planning process back in Europe when I was still living in the UK. And it gave me exposure to a tool that I think is underrepresented as a management tool in business that can be very, very powerful in terms of helping leaders think about plausible, possible, probable futures that might play out. It's not about forecasting. It's not about predicting. It's about saying, look, there are three or four typically ways that the world can play out in the future. Let's paint a picture of what those futures could look like and, and say, okay, if that played out, are we prepared? Do we have the right shock absorbers in place to handle that situation? And I think that there's never been a more important time than now, you know, as we hopefully in Canada get through this pandemic. I think, you know, there's a signal to for us to look at in the US with things returning back to normal that it will go that way. I think it's a great time for management teams in all kinds of sectors to take stock and say, okay, what next? And are we prepared? Hmm. So I've got a two-part question for you. <clears throat> One is, uh, what is your process for using it or deploying it with a team? So as, as granular as you can get so that people can, you know, take notes and apply it with their team. So that's like, how do you do it? But then the second part, which I'm particularly interested in, is how do you adapt it? Because let's say five years ago, you used scenario planning to look at the future, and it went into one of those quadrants that you didn't expect at all. You know, how do you sort of pivot? How do you address address the changes? So I'll let you approach that question, you know, sharing anything that you think would be helpful for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, what the, <clears throat> one of the things that I, that I talk about in, in Disaster Proof um, in the book is um, a, a very straightforward six-step process. And I, before I get into the process, I would say, uh, Anthony, the way I try to write the book was in a way that it's accessible to all kinds of people. So you don't need to be a deep strategist with you know, decades of experience to apply the concepts. The concepts are pretty simple. There are some novel things that I've introduced and there are some complexities, but generally speaking, the six steps, six step process is, is very simple to apply. And, and this is why I think it's just such a great tool that you know, analysts, planners, scenario planners, leaders should be adopting it. So what are the six steps? The, the, the first step is really, okay, um, let's define the scope of what we're trying to solve for and the critical questions and identify the stakeholders involved, step one. So once you've figured out in step one, okay, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Then step two is, okay, let's explore the environment and do some research. And so this is where you do the primary and the secondary research and you're trying to figure out, you know, what are the important trends, uncertainties, threats, risks that are going on in the world. So that's kind of step, step two. Step three is, okay, we've gathered all this information, we've done the research, what does it actually mean? So you analyze those tre trends, risks and uncertainties and you might start to prioritize certain ones because you're going to gather a lot of information. I mean, this, is, this can be a three-day process or a three-month process. You can put as much or little into this as you, you wish to, depending on the resources that you have. So that step three is, okay, we've gathered this information. What does it mean? Uh, what are the risks and uncertainties? And then step four is, okay, now we've got all that information. We've analyzed it. Let's build some scenarios and some signposts that would give us a clue as to which of those scenarios is playing out real real time. 
You then in step five, confirm the scenarios and stress test them. So here you're trying to say, okay, we've got these, you know, plausible visions of how the future might play out. Let's say we've got four of them or three of them, or sometimes just two. Let's now test our strategy that we've defined, assuming you've defined it, because you need to do that as well. Test our strategy against those different scenarios to say, okay, what, what we planned on doing, do we, do we still need to do it? The initiatives and the investments that we've made, do we still need, do they still hold water under this scenario? And then do it again with scenario B, C, and D. And so effectively, you're trying to figure out like what are the what are the strategies and the initiatives and the investments and plans that we've got? What holds true regardless? And what do we need to pivot depending on 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 the scenario that's playing out? And then the final step is monitoring those signposts or those signals and executing on the strategy. And I think that comes to the other part of your question, uh, Anthony, is is okay, so so now we've got the process up and running. How do we kind of keep it going? And I think that's where the signals and the signposts come in, in, into play, where you're saying, yeah, we need to monitor that. And your signal or signpost might be COVID cases. It could be, you know, what is foreign direct investment doing in Canada? Or it could be, you know, where's the consumer price index? What's interest rates doing? Depending on what kind of company you are, you're trying to figure out what are the signals that are important to you. So six easy steps, you go through them. And then I would also say, Anthony, you need to keep it refreshed, right? Because these things can go stale. And so you're looking at it on a period, periodic basis. So hopefully that makes you know a bit of sense to your viewers. I try to kind of keep that you know fairly straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. What I really like about it is, you know, the the call it pre-work, but it's really like step one through three is, well, A, being really clear about what you're trying to solve, the data gathering, synthesizing the data, data, building the scenarios. But what I think some people miss are the signposts. Like what are the sort of, I don't know what the, like lit, the points at which point, hey, we need to divert, diverge or something. COVID cases, what you mentioned, and one of our, our clients said, hey, you know, when COVID cases get to 200 a day, that's bad they're in Ontario, you know, it, it got worse. And, and, uh, but it was unfathomable at the time because we said, wow, 200, it could, it could never really happen. Um, and then again, testing the strategy within that. But one thing I think people might miss is the adapting, the acting and reacting to the signposts when it's happening. Like, how do you implement that? So what would you say to people who, you know, the signs tell them to do something, you know, how do they have to tangibly connect that with actions moving forward? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's it's a really interesting question because I think my experience with different organizations would be there's a tendency to treat strategy as a linear process where it's like point A to point B and then, you know, every couple of years we kind of refresh it and what I'm advocating through the book is actually we need organizations to be much more nimble and strategically flexible in terms of how they think about the strategic decisions that they made. And it's OK to say, yeah, we made that investment decision. But actually, given the signposts and signals that you pointed out, it no longer makes sense because the world has changed. You know, one of the things that I talk about in, in the book is is the the benefits of scenario planning and i and i through my research i came up with this 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 pretty simple model which says there's really a set of input benefits of why you do it which is better risk management and better assessment of uncertainty and then there's a set of process benefits which is you want the organization to be an organizational learning type of firm you want better assessment of options to your point, Anthony, and you want validation and stress testing of strategy. But then the output benefits, if you do all those input and process things well, are you make better complex decisions in a very complex world that we live in. You're more nimble to your point, Anthony. And in some cases you might innovate. I mean, there's a great example of the Port of Vancouver. They used scenario planning back in 2015 
and they were able to use it to help paint a vision of a, of a scenario around sustainability. And it actually resulted in them forming a partnership with BC Hydro around their sustainable energy future. So it was a direct example of scenario planning and forming a very strategic decision around innovation and partnership that otherwise wouldn't have happened had they gone down a linear process. So very powerful. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I find scenario planning is useful to, to hedge your bets. I mean, like not putting all your eggs in one basket and and the the idea that strategy needs to be nimble is is never more relevant and important than now. So there's a question in the chat and then I'm gonna ask you a slightly different tangent question. The question was, uh, how many scenarios would you test your strategies against? The world of possible futures is large, so how to pick which to investigate? And that's from Allison. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, I mean, I think the, thank you for the question, Allison. Um, you know, great, great question. I, my experience has been two to four. I think if you've got more than four, um, you are just stress testing against nuances of a future possibility versus something that's fundamentally different. Most organizations are in that two to four range. Some organizations like to use the two by two. Um, if you uh, check out some of my blog uh, post on my LinkedIn profile, you'll see an article where I talk about uh, the two by two. It's a nice way of looking at two key uncertainties and then using those two axes to plot a two by two. But uh, you know, I'm working with an organization right now that has focused on two uh, polar opposites and really stress testing against those two. So, um, I think two to four is the way to go. Hmm. Plus you could like to Allison's point, you could do so many different versions. And I think it's like the key drivers and, you know, looking for that alignment, looking for that separateness. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube or you have any questions in the chat, be sure to put them in there. So Lance, I have a slightly different question for you. You mentioned the importance of strategy being nimble and adaptive. At the same time, I see that you teach. You teach in academia. And so I'm thinking of our leaders that have, um, you know, relatively inexperienced people in their team for whatever reason, and they have like the book learning. You know, what are you seeing out of the people going through university or going through MBA programs, how they're approaching strategy? Are they approaching it with book learning? Are they approaching it with like the agile sort of entrepreneur style? Or are you finding it's a, a balance between the two? I mean, I, you know, when I did my MBA 20 years ago, if I look at what kids are doing today in university, it's very, very different and in a, in a good way. Um, like when I was doing my MBA, it was, um, so I went, I did my MBA back in the UK. Most of your viewers probably wouldn't even know where Cardiff is in Wales. Um, lots of sheep there. Uh, but great university, great academic uh, group there. And it was very book focused. Um, fast forward to, to, to today, you know, I get pulled into judge case competitions um, where, you know, students are working on real world problems and using practical tools to come up with solutions for real world companies. Um, you know, one of the one of the programs that I, I get pulled into, the advanced strategy program at Haskain, I think Haskain does a wonderful job of, um, you know, sourcing companies in, you know, small and medium sized companies and saying, hey, give us your real world problems and then we'll put a bunch of students on it to kind of help work, work with your, your teams for solutions. And I see kind of much, much, much more of, of that. But I, there's, there's kind of a, it's a double, that like, there, there's another side to it, Anthony, which is I, I do still think that academia has a long way to go to develop research that's much more practical and can be applied in the real world. So I do a lot of research um, with full on academics and you pick up some of these papers and they're very, very hard to read and understand. and and you kind of read them and you're like, well, how does this apply to the real world? You've picked one very, very small part of a particular problem that you're trying to solve. But for a leader or a CEO or a business unit leader, it's kind of meaningless. 
Um, and I, so I, I, there is a movement with within the academic circles to say we need to be when we're doing research. And I, I, I love the direction it's going. We, when we do research, we need to be bringing academics together with practitioners and doing more combined research together that looks at the problem from both lenses. And I think when we figured that out, and it's a journey, uh, I think we're going to have much more practical research that then leaders can take forward and, and apply in the real world. Mm, I get that. Um, so th that application piece, I mean, what sort of advice would you give or what advice are you giving now to, to senior leaders who might be resisting some of the change that's happened, you know, because it's especially in an industry like like oil and gas, where there is, you know, a lot of tradition, there's a lot of things that have been going forward. How are you seeing them adapting that flexibility and be willing to change? Is scenario planning enough to open their eyes? Or do you have to institute change management, leadership training behind the scenes in order to, to move that forward successfully? Yeah, I mean, that's a complex question. Uh, and there isn't like, you know, uh, you wouldn't be doing your job if you weren't asking me those kind of questions. So uh, I think it, it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's a combination of things that need to happen. Um, you know, if we take the oil and gas industry, for example, which is, is a particular sector I know quite well, um, I think there are very progressive leaders that recognize that decarbonization is very important, that um, energy transition is happening. You know, we're dealing with an ex existential climate crisis and the industry has to play a role. And they're very progressive in terms of, hey, you know, we're going to have to institute process technology that cleans up the amount of carbon we emit into the atmosphere. Um, we need to kind of shift our portfolio to more clean tech and renewables. We need to be investing in technology. And then you know what? There are companies that are not doing that, um, either because they don't believe in it and they can't afford it. I take a lot of um, um, uh, confidence in that there are some very large companies that are really leading the way and, and, and hopefully others will 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 follow them i think it's up to um the other part of your question i think ceos play a role to set the tone from the top i think advisors like myself and others play a role as well um and but it's 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 government as well i mean i was reading something the other day about just the importance of um policy and regulation within the system and how that needs to play a role in terms of driving change and innovation. You can take it too far. You need to be able to do it in a collaborative way where industry and the regulators are working together. But I do think regulators play a role by putting a line in the sand to say, you know, you do need to innovate because if you don't, it's gonna cost you money and you might lose your license to operate. Um, it's clearly not as simple as that, but, but, I, but I think that there's a, there's a role that different ecosystem players need to uh, each take on to solve the problem together. Yeah, and that's why I think, uh, th thank you for that. And I appreciate you taking my challenging question because you know, well, I'm not gonna give you just softballs all day, but I think it's neat um, as a tool using scenario planning. And I'd love your perspective on this is when you get different stakeholders in the room to be able to have per all look at the same problem, but have different people's lenses on it. And then that collaboration that, um, yeah, they're just working together information sharing on solving the common problem. And it's a really useful tool to be able to sort of bridge the gap between potentially like not opposing forces, but um, different perspectives. Yeah. Have you any practical examples of when you've used that to sort of bridge the gap between yeah. different groups? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it takes power and politics out of, out of the room, right? Because it's not, I'm defending my position against yours. And, you know, I remember uh, talking about this and, and working on this with, with one oil and gas company. Um, it, it, it's about, hey, here are four futures playing out that could play out. And it's not that I'm advocating for one or another, but let's look at them for what they are and say, well, what would we do in each of these situations? Um, 
And I think the cross-functional involvement that you talk about, like I, I get in, uh, involved a lot with leadership teams, like I'm working with one company right now where I'm working with the ELT um, and it's, it's just the ELT. But I think that there is power in bringing other stakeholders to the table when you're really discussing those scenarios to get those different lenses. The, you know, the great example that I talk about in the book is called the Montfleur scenarios. You know, when you go back and you look in history, when South Africa as a country um, uh, released Nelson Mandela from, you know, 24 years in on Robben Island in prison, um, you know, Mandela could have turned around and said, you know, I want revenge and retribution for the oppression of um, the black majority in South Africa. But actually what they did is they used scenario planning, believe it or not, and they brought a cross section of stakeholders together to discuss what kind of future that they wanted. They brought academia together, business leaders, political leaders, and said, let's play out the future for South Africa and decide what scenario do we want as a country? You know, another example of this and a very pertinent one, because you kind of got me going here, um, is, is um, Event 201. So I would encourage your listeners, if they're interested, to look at Event 201's website. And it's a, basically, it's John Hopkins University, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation coming together and actually painting a picture of what would the future look like? This was in October 2018. What would the future look like if a global pandemic happened? Let's play out that scenario. And so they talked about, you know, a virus that wasn't particularly deadly spreading because a lot of people were asymptomatic. They talked about the virus spreading through international air travel, originating from bats to pigs to humans in Brazil. They talked about how international cooperation would break down, but needed to, you know, if, if there was ever a time that it would be important, it would be now. They talked about a shortage of PPE equipment. They talked about misinformation and disinformation. And I think about 5g networks and at one point certain people were saying like 5g networks spread the virus on and on and on and so i looked at this example and i was like wow like here is some smart cross-functional academics business people um politicians coming together playing out different futures around the pandemic and boy one of their scenarios got it absolutely right but we largely ignored it yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's funny. And it's sort of what you said around well, my previous questions around when groups do it, they see the future. And I wrote like the writing was on the wall. The numbers are there because it takes the objectivity out of there. It's in the realm of possible because at least when we do it, we look at extremes. So if you're an extreme, it might be a big extreme, but possibility lives within it. And then you basically choose to ignore it. I mean, what can you do? It's it's up to the leadership to say, great, I'm going to go behind that. And yeah, it's 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 up to you as a leader to say, hey, which of these are you going to go after and which are you not going to go after? And, you know, that's the inherent risk of doing that. So I think it's just interesting that even presented with information, we're not going to go down a COVID rabbit hole around the relevance of all of that. But, you know, you've got the information there. You did it. The other analogy that in my head is like in action movies or like, you know, when there's like the world is going to end. OK, we need to blow up this asteroid. Like, let's come up with like 50 different ways we could blow. I guess that's the plot to Armageddon. Spoiler alert. Um, but they had to do scenario planning to figure out, hey, if this happens, then what? If this, then what? And that's yeah, right. the really basic version of it. Right. And it's something I think there's something I'll give you another example, another practical example. I was working with a, an apple, um, a very large airport. And, and I was sat with the leadership team and, and we were talking about how bad could airline passenger traffic, like what, what, what's the worst case, right? And, and this was several years ago and we were kind of looking at it and, and you know, the, the CEO looked at me and he said like, well, you know, when we look at September 9-11, 
passenger traffic, I think it was in North America, went down by 5%. So, so the worst case situation could be maybe 6%, I think, was what we, you kind of looked at me, what do you think? I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty bad, right? A couple of years later, it actually went down 95%. So there's something in the human psyche, which is we do a poor job, and I talk about this in the book, of really challenging ourselves to widen the riverbanks and explore the possibilities. And I think that's an absolutely critical leadership trait that we need to be installing in, in, you know, in, in companies and in organizations from a, from a strategy perspective. Yeah. I mean, the, in the, in the day to day, you know, we've, uh, we haven't coined it. We just talk about it recently. That idea of toxic positivity is that people are like, oh yeah, this will be fine. Oh, there's no need in prioritizing right, this because right. we're going to be able to work on it. It's going to be all right. And, uh, there is a very valuable devil's advocate. Let's really look at the worst that could possibly happen because then we're going to be cautiously pessimistic to say, okay. And even then, if you would have guessed 95% of air travel is going to go down, you'd probably be wrong. Um, well, unless you were right. Um, okay. I have a, a, a question going back to the South Africa example. And it's another one from Allison, who I appreciate the engagement. So she said, uh, can you talk about the foresight for social goals and, but before you answer that, I was curious when we do scenario planning, typically you have a timeline. What was the timeline that they used? If, if you remember, was it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? And, and then we can talk about how to impl implement it for social goals. If you remember. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to think, I mean, I think from what I recall, um, I think that they were talking long-term 10 sort of a 10 or 20 year journey of the future of the country was kind of their time horizon. And then just help me out, Anthony, like what's this, the connection to the social goals? Oh, I think uh, maybe there wasn't a connection, but I would assert that if they were trying to go from a bad situation to a better situation, their current state to their ideal future state, that within that there was some sort of, you know, uh, I don't want to say optimism, but what would our social fabric look like? Because I think it's beholden to all organizations, whether you're in academia, whether you're in oil and gas, whether you're in consumer products, that you should probably have some positive contribution to society, uh, both because it's air quotes morally good, but also there's probably a good business case behind it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's, there's different ways of kind of cracking, I think, that problem. One is... Yes, you can embed that thinking in your scenario planning process. And I'm, I'm sure as part of, of the work on the Montfleur scenarios in South Africa, a key part of that would have been, you know, the oppression of the majority black society and the importance of opening that up so that, you know, um, everyone had an equal vote and, and everybody was equally represented in society. That was absolutely essential and that that was but but i think that they were conscious that it could go the other way where it's about revenge and retribution against you know the majority white politicians and and government in power and i think one the scenario that they tried to play out was we want equality here and uh, and i admire you know the way those different leaders approach that i also think with um you know, DNI is just so important. ESG is so important. I think you know we're seeing a lot of organisations now focus on you know their ESG reporting and metrics, and and that's another way of kind of tackling some of these uh, some of these issues that are just so important to society right now. And just so we're clear, the ESG environmental sustainability goals. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Cool. Just making sure. Um, and I think one of the things that stuck with me that I'm going to take from today is, is really the step one is like, what is the thing that we are trying to solve for? If we are trying to solve for environmental sustainability, then let's build a scenario plan out of that. If we're trying to solve for community development, like let's look for that. Are we trying to solve for education and future learning? Let's solve for that and then use that as a lens um, for our scenario planning. Which Anything, go, go am I on the right track there? Right. 
it goes back to step one. One of the first questions you asked me was, you know, when you think about um, the steps that you go through, I think defining the problem that you're trying to solve for is absolutely critical. And, yeah, and also, awesome. what level are you working at? Because remember, and I, again, this is one of the newer things in the book, which I talk about, like, figuring out what level are you operating at? You're trying to solve, like, macro issues, you know, like World Economic Forum type issues, climate climate crisis, disease control. Are you looking at industry issues? So, you know, I spend a lot of time in the energy industry and industry associations are trying to help, you know, and, and policy forums are trying to solve these big complex industry problems then you've got at the organizational level and then you can use it at the the functional functional level even the project level you can say look we're going to make a major investment decision let's play out different scenarios in terms of the context the environment and would our investment in that capital project change based on the uncertainties that could play out in the external environment hmm I think that's really cool because I had I had always looked at it as like a thirty thousand foot exercise, not at like the project level. So I think that's really really neat, um, and it's I find it interesting and just on my personal experience when I see people, we do a pestle analysis as part of our you know basic strategic planning. Like we include the pestle because you can't look at a vision without looking at the future. Some people say, "Oh, I could have done without that exercise," and some people are say, "Wow, it was really neat to think about." the future you know and i just found it interesting the parallel between some people who want to look long range and be able to make their decisions with that input and some people who don't even consider the future in their their strategy discussions so um any words of advice or any sort of guidance you'd give to leaders about having their teams i don't know have one or both perspectives in terms of one eye on the on the future and, and one one eye on, on the yeah i mean i think one of the things that i talk about in the in the book is i think when you're looking at complexity and uncertainty anthony like it there's there's an element of looking at what's happened in the past to predict the future but i think you need to look at it through three lenses i think you need to look at the past you need to look at what's ca hap currently happening right now and you also need to look at what might happen in the future and you're constantly kind of going through through those three lenses, the, you know, the past, the current, and the future, and kind of thinking about it that way. Got it. So um, it's it's a wonderful life, that guy. Anyways, I, I can't remember if that's something like you know that. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know what I mean. Um, cool. So we're going to slowly wrap up. I, our next guest on the podcast, Gleb Zapersky, is also going to talk about a different lens through scenario planning and basically looking at you know that you're you're bad at making decisions. You've got a like don't trust your gut, uh, and talking about scenario planning about that. And I think it really speaks to being able to look to the past, the present, and the future about making decisions. Cat uh, Ryan has a question. What are the best ways to conduct research for environmental trends, both macro and economic? So you mentioned the primary and secondary data. Are there any like go-tos that you you look at to be able to solicit that feedback? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you mentioned one which is Pastel. In fact, I'm working with a non non for profit. I'm running a workshop uh, tomorrow. In fact, uh, with them, where we're using Pastel to feed into the beginning of. Um, a scenario planning process that we're going to do together uh, later in uh, later in May and June. Um, so I think you can use tools like that. I think you can use tools like Porter's Five Forces as a go-to tool. I think SWOT helps you certainly look at some of the internal things, but it can help you look at the opportunities and and the external threats. Look, there's lots of different tools out there that help you effectively collect information. And I think you have to be clear when you're doing that primary and secondary research. Um, you know, what What are we, again, what problem are we trying to solve? Because that will give you a clue as to what to look for in terms of the information. And one of the other things that I talk about in the book is, you know, we live in a world, Anthony, where there are um, oodles of information for us to process and consider. And you know, IBM would say, you know, more information and data has been created in the last two years than the rest of history combined. And so for leaders and management teams, it's incredibly challenging to figure out what data in my research is important. What do I need to take seriously and what can I ignore? 
And this is where I talk about in the book the importance of artificial intelligence and particularly the use of natural language processing as a way of gathering insights on risks, threats, uncertainties that we can then use in the scenario planning process in the future. And I think as strategists, Anthony, like we, how we do work is gonna fundamentally change in the next decade. We are going to be using AI tools much more progressively on the highest level strategic processes and organizations like we've never done before. And I think, you know, on the one hand, that's a little bit daunting, um, certainly for non-tech savvy people like me, uh, but it's also exciting because I think the capability of your strategic minds in companies will really elevate to a new level we've not seen before. Yeah, I don't think it's even considering the cost decreases, accessibility increases of something that can beat the you know, beat us up in terms of strategists being able to do it, being able to incorporate that. Um, just as we as we finish up here, um, do you have maybe two or three words of uh, advice you'd like to give to CEOs or leaders as they embark on this, you know, scenario planning journey and, and start evolving their capacity to to implement this and to look at those decisions? I mean, I, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've been um advocating for is now's the, t the right time to do this. So that would be my first message, you know, and that's why the book is called Post Pandemic Future, um, because I think the last 12 months has been incredibly challenging for CEOs and leaders. So this is a great time to take stock and say, OK, as we get through this pandemic, what are the different futures that can play out, you know, thus forward? So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is um, just the importance of integrating strategy, risk, and technology. And one of the things that I talk about is the confluence of strategy, risk, and technology and bringing those things together, you know, in a much more uh, progressive way. And I think the final thing is, you know, don't be afraid by stretching those riverbanks, that, that divergent thinking, and really challenging yourself to say, how good or how bad could things get? And, and are we truly prepared? I think if you're doing it right, Anthony, you are taking yourself outside of the comfort zone. Uh, and if CEOs and leaders feel uncomfortable, you're probably doing something right. I really love that. I think it's not the idea is not to be comfortable with it and to ask yourself the tough questions so that you can um, really reflect on are we doing it well? Are we not doing it well? And, you know, are we going to be prepared? Because the last thing you want to do is be unprepared. And I found that just doing the exercise and reflecting on that helps people be at least grounded in the uncertainty in the absence of actually having certainty. So um, yeah, everybody, I, mean, I, I, I call it wallowing in the ambiguity. Don't be afraid to wallow in the ambiguity. <laughs> awesome. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know we put Lance's uh, LinkedIn profile in the chat. So if you're interested in connecting with him, Jason's going to drop uh, Lance's book so you can pick up his book. Um, and then also, if you're interested in continuing the conversation, we put a link to our strategy and leadership community um, so that you can meet with other professionals and talk about your learning from today, as well as other podcasts and things that we share. Uh, Lance, where can people get a hold of you and where can they learn more about what you're working on? Yeah, if you uh, visit my website, www.lancemortlock.com or on LinkedIn, those are the two best ways. Awesome. Thank you, Lance. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. I really, I know personally, my scenario planning lens and thinking has improved out of today. And I know a lot of people got a lot of value. So if you enjoyed today, be sure to put it in the chat. Thanks, Lance. And uh, Lance, again, just thank you for your time today. It's been really, really fun and super enjoyable. Thanks for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today has been Lance Mortlock, who is the senior EY strategy partner. He's a professor at the uh, Haskeen School of, oh, he's a visiting professor at Haskeen School of Business um, and is also the author of Disaster Proof, Scenario Planning for a Post-Pandemic 
future. So be sure to get his book on uh, Amazon. And if you know somebody who is struggling with looking into the future, be sure to send them this podcast. So uh, thanks again, Lance. It's been a pleasure today. Uh, my name is Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.